And it is time for IAEI News Live. My name is Thomas Dimitrovich, and today we are going to cover energy storage systems. So grab, grab your code book, 2023. And if you, um, if you don't have a 2023 code book, then you can grab your 2020 code book, whichever is your pleasure. Um, make it happen. All right, so hold on. So I got to see the uh, <laughs> add Gmail. Gosh, oh, Neds. All right, so. Um, Today's, this, today's topic is energy storage systems here on IAEI News Live, and it all starts right now. All right, Steve Froming, 2017. Oh my gosh, hold on. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> Go back there. 2017, Steve. And Michael Hofkin in the house. Hey, there we go. So I had a hard time. My um my chat box wasn't come up on, coming up on this screen because I had to log in. And then you know what happened, Michael? I go to log in, I put my user ID and password, and then it says it puts those pictures and you know, highlight all the cars. And you gotta click through all the cars. And then it's like highlight all the buses. I'm like, oh my gosh. Why doesn't this stuff happen to someone else, not me? All right. Well, Steve Froming in the house, if I can only do what I can do. So, all right. So, Tim McClochy, man, what are you doing out there when you should be over here? Man, 2017 in Pennsylvania. Gosh, I have to go behind the green screen to even get, no. I don't have to go behind the green screen to get the 2017 code. You know why? Nihad El Sharif is going to tell you why. Because I have, under my possession, I have this. I have the entire encyclopedia of NFPA documents at my fingertips. You know why? Because I have a subscription. I got a prescription. I got a subscription for NFPA link. So you can go in here. Look, I have the 2017 code book right here, Michael. So, and, and, and here's my thoughts. Michael, you need to be doing. So I have the link. You need to get to work, brother. I know. I feel sorry. I know you're in mourning because. You lost, the Eagles lost this Sunday. I know, I mean, I can't say that I'm shedding the same tears, but um, Carlos, 2017. Jeez, oh man, 2017 code is like running rampant. Why can't we get you guys off of 2017 code? What is it that you love about the 2017 code? And Mr. Wages in the house, Joseph. All right. So here's my thought process. Um, and I can grab, I'm going to open up since there are a few people that are on the 17 code. I'm going to open up uh, the 17 code and I'm going to do a quick search for energy storage systems and see if there's a definition in here. Because what I want to do, there is a seven, it was Article 706, Energy Storage Systems. 706.2. So in the 2023 code, in the 2023 code, energy storage systems, the definition is in Article 100. Your poor eagles. Oh, man. That was wow. I stayed up for that one, buddy. Stayed up for that one. So Energy storage systems as part of the 2023 code. And I'll, I have the, um, 
I have the definition in the 17 code as well. So let me, uh, I'm going to open up my 2023 code book. Like, how many times did I say 2023 code book? I'm telling you, you guys and gals got to get on the 2023 code. Come on, get with the times. So energy storage system is defined on page 38 of the 2023 code book. All right, page 38. Now, what we know about an energy storage system is that it's one or more devices. It's installed as a system capable of storing energy and providing electrical energy. So far, so far, I have defined a battery. A battery is one device. A battery can be installed as a system. And a battery, just like a lead acid battery, can be capable of storing energy and providing electrical energy. Um, now, can I take a battery and provide it for premises wiring systems or an electric power production and distribution network? So the way the language reads for an energy storage system is one or more devices installed as a system capable of storing energy and providing electrical energy into the premises wiring system or an electric power production and distribution network. So this, so this is a panel 13. So um, what do we have? Uh, Steve Froming in the house. You were out there. I know you're there. So now the 17 code says one or more components assembled together, capable of storing energy for use at a future time. So, similar, at a future time is in the 17 code. Energy storage systems can include, but is not limited to batteries, capacitors, kinetic energy devices, flywheels, and compressed air. These systems can have AC or DC output, or utilization and can include inverters and converters to change stored energy into electrical energy. Now, there are a lot of issues, I think, in regard to the style manual with the current definition that was in the 17 code. But the essence, the essence of what an energy storage system is, is there. Now, what they did in the 2020 code, and I don't know, or the 2023 code, and I don't know if they did this in the 2020 code. Uh, 706, 706.2. I'm just going to take a, kill, a quick gander. A quick gander at 706.2 uh, and providing electric energy into premises wiring system or an electric power. All right, so they fixed this last cycle in the 2020 code where they took some of the components and they said, like, like in the 17 code, they said that it can be include limited, it could, it could include batteries, capacitors, kinetic energy devices. So they added that in an informational note. So batteries, capacitors, kinetic energy devices, flywheels and compressed air is still in the 2023 code. It's still in the 2020 code, but it was in the parent text of the definition in the 17 code. And that was new for the 17 code. So you guys are at least, just think of the poor souls that are not on the 17 code yet, right? They would not have this definition. They would not have the requirements. So um, can include inverters or converters. And it says, um, can include inverters and converters to change stored energy into electric energy. So the 17 code had the text that is in informational note number one for the 2023 code. So we know that an energy storage system can have batteries, it can have capacitors, it can have kinetic energy devices, flywheels and compressed air. Well, so can a UPS. Is a UPS an energy storage system? Is it not an energy storage system? If I hook uh, 12 batteries together, can I call it an energy storage system? It, it stores energy, it has batteries. If I have some uh, supercapacitors and I put them all into a bank, can I call it an energy storage system? Mr. Hofkin, what say ye? What say ye, my friend? We're going to learn if you can or can't. All right, so we at least know the definition. Now, 
there is an inf there is a second informational note that was in the 2020 code and is still in the 2023 code that says Oh, wait a second. Hold on. Yeah, it is. In, so the systems differ. So they differ from stationary batteries, standby batteries. How do they differ? How do they differ, Michael? Hey, Robert from Omaha. Don't be late, but you're worth the wait. Differ from a stationary standby battery installation. A battery sits in readiness for a discharge event. The majority of time spent on the continuous float charge or in a high state of charge. So the difference between an energy storage system and other things like a UPS and, and, and stand... Oh, so there's a little difference. These systems differ from a stationary standby battery installation. In, in the 2020 code, they says these systems differ from other storage systems, such as a UPS, which is a power supply used to provide alternate current power to a load for some period of time in the event of power failure. They changed that. These systems differ from a stationary standby battery installation where a battery spends the majority of the time on continuous flow charge or in a high state of charge. That's me, Robert. I'm in a high state of charge all the time. Michael, in accordance with the UL standards for safety for energy storage systems, UL 9540, but a bing, but a boom, but a bang, you nailed it. All right, so, and Robert from Omaha, you did as well. UPS is backup. Energy storage is use it or, <laughs> use it or lose it. I like it. I like it. So if you think about an energy storage system, these are all the different types of references that you have uh, for energy storage systems. These are your reference documents. If you're dealing with an energy storage system, I would argue, and hopefully successfully, <laughs> I would argue that you need to have an NFPA-1 understanding. You need to have an NFPA 855 understanding. Now, 111, I'm on the fence. And, and, and Stephen Froming, Mr. Froming, I would, I would like to have your opinion on that too. NFPA 111, standard for on stored electrical energy, emergency and standby power systems. So, I guess those are those would be energy storage systems that might be in those, you know, exit signs and 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 whatnot. But Article seven o Article seven o six Article seven o six is pretty specific in regard to what it applies to them now. Now that doesn't mean, okay, so here's, here's, here's my thought process. The size of the energy storage system matters when you get into whether or not you have to follow the requirements in 706, right? It's because 706 tells you in the scope, in the National Electrical Code, and just to be clear, we're talking Article seven. Let me do this. Let me get. Let me just get that out of your the clutter out of your mind. I'm talking National Electrical Code, Article seven o six, which is titled Energy Storage Systems, and in the 2020 code and in the 2023 code. And let me take a look at the 2017 code. Willie Snyder in the house. And it wasn't in the 17 code. So the 17 code applies to any energy storage system. And to Mr. Hofkin and Robert's point, if they are listed to UL standard 9540, that is the standard for safety 
for energy storage systems and equipment. So if you have a system that is listed to UL 9540, then you're following Article 706. You know you're automatically into an energy storage system. It's not a UPS because a UPS, Michael, what's the standard for UPSs? Um, UL standard or UPS, uninterruptible power is UL 1778. So if I have a UPS, it's listed to UL 1778. If I have an energy storage system, it's listed to UL 9540. That's a big difference. Uh, Steve Froming says, most electrical workers are only NEC. They have no way to know to reference other standards or have acts. Whoa, hold on. Wait a second. Steve. Steve, Steve, Steve. If they've got NFPA link, if they have NFPA link, they have access to 1, 111, and 855 right off the bat because I got access. So, they, so if you're dealing with an energy storage system from an NFPA perspective, now you said other standards or have access to them. This is the value of NFPA link. This gets you access now. It's only NFPA. Now, from a UL standard perspective, and Michael, correct me if you think I'm wrong, and, and anybody else out there from any other NERDL nationally recognized testing laboratory or anybody out there who's familiar with this stuff, but I know, Michael, you're out there. From an installation perspective, to Steve Froming's point, when they install this, they're going to be looking at the National Electrical Code. They're going to be looking at Article 706. They're going to see whether or not now, if you're in the 2017 version, any energy storage system, you're going to be following 706. In, in the 2020 code, they said that 706 only applies when the energy storage system has a capacity greater than 3.6 megajoules or one kilowatt hour. So now they've limited the application of 706 to, to or I guess, you know, a little bit larger systems, anything greater than those numbers. But from a UL perspective, what you're going to be looking for is the label, right? I mean, if it's not listed, if it's listed, then you know if it has a UL 810 or 9, uh, 9540 label on it, then you're going to follow the manufacturer's instructions, which should be in accordance with the requirements in UL 9540. You can probably go to the UL. Um... <laughs> oh, man. It used to be the white book. I, I can't. Michael, I'm sorry. The UL. Um... Oh, man. I'm going to catch a lot of grief over this one. The UL guide cards. Boing. All right. So you go to the UL guide cards at product IQ. <laughs> That's the word. I can't. I got, you know what I need, Michael? I need a sign that I can hang on this wall that says UL product IQ because I can never remember that. Anyway, uh, you go to product IQ and that will give the user for free access to information around anything that's listed to UL 9540. So you go to Product IQ. It's a lot of information for the installer to Michael's point. So you have 706, but if you're installing a energy storage system, come on, I know, I know I'm an idiot. If you're installing an energy storage system, you should be also looking at 855. Now, what is 855? 855 is the standard for the installation of stationary energy storage systems. And so if you're installing a stationary energy storage system and you're just following Article 706, I think you are, you're, you, you are, you are um, limiting yourself. You should be more encompassing. The scope of 855 says this standard applies this standard applies to
This standard applies to the design, construction, installation, commissioning, operation, and maintenance, and decommissioning of stationary energy storage systems, including mobile and portable energy storage system install, installed in a stationary situation and the storage of lithium metal or lithium ion batteries. If there was any a single reason why you should buy that standard or get NFK link to get access to it, if you're installing it and you don't know what's in here, then I think it's like flying by the seat of your pants. My cousin one time, I asked my cousin, my cousin works or owned his own contracting firm. Now he works for a very large contracting firm. And I asked him, I said, I said, Anthony, I was, I was doing an article on electrical safety and an electrical safety plan. I sent him an email. I said, hey, cuz, if, do you have an electrical safety plan? And, and, and is it important to you? And, he, and his response, his email back was, if you don't have an electrical safety plan, you're flying by the seat of your pants. And from an importance perspective, they got business. His company got business because of his electrical safety plan. Gotta love this. He goes to a major industrial. I know this is not energy storage systems, but it's related. He goes to a major industrial and he wants this business. So what does he do when he comes to the bargaining table, the negotiating table, and, and they're talking about each other's companies, what the opportunity is, all that good stuff. He has his safety plan in a binder with him. In his, you know, bag of books. And he sits down at the table with them and he says, first off, we are a safe organization. We have rules that we follow. And he pulls his safety plan out. And he says, these are the rules we follow. And I need you to agree to these because if you don't, then we're going to have issues. And you know what they did? They got up, they walked out, and they came back with their safety plan. And the rest of that meeting was all around safety. Both organizations, the major contracting firm, the major industrial, looking at a safety plan to make sure they were in alignment on what's justified energized work, how to do hot work permits, everything. They built it around that safety plan. They still have a great relationship today, to my knowledge. Now, if you are not following and, and you have no awareness of 855, then in my opinion, you're flying by the seat of your pants. You need to understand the bigger picture of a lot of these things. So you got 855. Um, if, you're, if you're putting in capacitors, 810A, standard for batteries for use in stationary vehicle Auxiliary power and light electric rail, 1973. I mean, if you're dealing with that, then you need to know it. These are just reference standards for you. Uh, the standard for standby batteries, 1989. That's another one. But 9540, um, and then there's an outline of investigation, spill containment for stationary lead-acid battery systems. I guess that's what the UL subject is. UL subject 2436. So I don't have the number in it. It's UL 2436. So, so now if you look at what the purpose of 855 is, right? So here's the purpose. The standard provides the minimum requirements for mitigating the hazards associated with energy storage systems and the storage of lithium metal or lithium ion batteries. So, if I zoom out, so I'm going to give you the chapters in 855. So, you have chapter two is reference publications. I'm just going to look at those. You got NFPA. Let's take a look at what the NFPA NFPA one, the fire code, uh, NFPA two, hydrogen technologies, 12. There's a lot of reference codes. Man, NFPA 70 is there. All right. Uh, chapter three is definitions. Chapter four is your general requirements. And in chapter four on 855 is you have general requirements, you have construction documents, emergency planning and training, a hazard mitigation analysis, combustible storage, equipment, installation. Which scope? Which scope? Which scope? Uh, I'm looking at the scope of NFPA 855. 855. 
And now I'm looking at the chapters in 855. Uh, installation, smoke and fire detection, fire control and suppression, mobile energy storage system equipment and operations. Chapter five is system interconnections. So you have your disconnecting means covered in there, non-electrical systems, your support systems. Chapter six is commissioning. So, so if we look at Article 706, and I know I love all you, you 2020 code book uh, fans out there, and I love you 2020, 2017 guys and gals, but I'm looking at the 2023 code. That's the way I roll. All right, so in 706, now, um, Chapter 6 in 855 is titled Commissioning, right? So let's take a look at commissioning. Oh, educational power. Robert, uh, what is the significance of the last sentence in the scope? Normal operating condition or state of being, not scope. Scope. Oh, all right. So 706. Let's look at the scope of 706. This article applies to all energy storage systems having a capacity greater than one kilowatt hour. So we know there's a size restriction that may be standalone or interactive. Ooh. Okay, standalone or interactive. And I believe in the 2023, um, I know I, I, mean, I get uh, squirrel, uh, standalone. Hold on. Standalone. Standalone. Is standalone. Yes, standalone system is a defined term in Article 100, a system that is not connected to an electric power production and distribution network. So we get our handy dandy highlighter. You know what I need to do is, oh, this would be cool. I got to get a special color in every defined term, just highlight. I wish. Oh, NFPA, NFPA, if you're out there listening, if you're watching this, and you have any say in NFPA link, I got an idea for you. Any place in the code where you use a defined term, put a hot link in. How about that, Michael? Robert, what do you think about that one? If you had NFPA link everywhere where there was a defined term, in fact, I'm gonna bring up the scope. I'm gonna bring up the scope, open a new tab of the 2023 code. Not the scope. I'm bringing up, yeah, the scope in 706. No, is, there's no hot link. So any place where you have a defined term that is used, you should put a hot link into that may be standalone or interactive. And interactive is also a defined term. We've got to go to I, interactive. Let me interactive. I inter interactive. Interrupting interactive. There's an interactive mode, uh, operating mode for power production equipment or microgrids that operate in parallel with and are capable of delivering energy to an electric power production and distribution network or other primary source. Primary source. So we have uh, stationary and interactive defined. So standalone and interactive are both defined terms with other electrical power production sources. These systems are primarily intended to store and provide energy during normal operating conditions. Wow. That, Robert. Robert, that's, that is a very interesting fact. Yeah is an interesting point. The point that Robert is making is Article 706, the last sentence of the scope says, these systems are primarily intended to store and provide energy during normal operating conditions. Now it says primarily intended. That doesn't mean it's always intended to supply power during normal operations. So what that would mean, an Article 700 system under emergency conditions would not be normal operations. Right, Steve? Right? And Lou, Lou's in the house. Good to see you, brother. 
So, these systems are primarily intended to store and provide energy during normal operation conditions. So, it doesn't say always, and it doesn't say that Article 706 only applies when you're providing normal operating conditions, under normal operating conditions. It just says that they are primarily intended to store. You know what? I don't like that sentence. What does it really tell you? It tells you nothing in reality. It says primarily intended. What does it mean? Why do you put it in the scope statement? What is the significance of it? The significance of the passage of time. I don't understand. I don't know what it is. So these systems are primarily intended to store and provide energy during normal operating conditions. But let's take a look. Steve Froming, Article um, 700. Let's look at 700. 700 is your life safety, right? So if I go to 700, uh, oh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to 700 here in, um, in NFPA link, and I'm going to do a search, energy storage. All right, so 700.12 E1, 700.12. E1, 712. So part three in Article 700 is sources of power. 712 are your general requirements. A is power source considerations. B is equipment design and location. C, supply duration. Duration is important. D, generator set. So we know we can use generators. And E, stored energy power supply systems. A sepsis, S-E-P-S-S. -S. Stored energy power supply systems shall comply with 700.12 E1 and E2. Oh, C4. No, 712 C4. What's C4? 700.12 C4 is your storage batteries and UPS. Michael, I would say that's not an energy storage system because they're just talking about storage batteries. But E is your energy. So that's a great distinction between the two. Great point. Thank you, Michael. So E1 says, what are the types of energy storage systems that are permitted? Because remember, what was the definition? The definition of an energy storage system said that an energy storage system can, can include Batteries, capacitors, kinetic energy devices, flywheels, and compressed air, right? So all of those can be included. If I look at E in 700.12E, the types that are permitted for use in an emergency system. Oh, man. I, I, oh, man, Michael. I'm not liking this. You know why? You know what my problem is? Here's my problem. And this is new. Gosh darn it. Steve Froming, what are you doing? What are you doing, Steve? So here's my problem. Here, I, I, I'm just saying, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. And we know what an energy storage system, how it's defined. And we said an energy storage system is what? Not a UPS, right? Because an energy storage system is going to be listed. Now, you've got to love in them, a storage, stored energy power supply system. That's not an energy storage system. So, all right. So, I, so stored energy power supply system. Let's see if it's defined. Stored energy power supply system is not necessarily an energy storage system. So, you're out of the, you're out of the hot water, Steve. Let's take a look and see if stored energy power system is defined stored energy power supply system it is a defined term a stored energy power supply system is a complete functioning epss powered by a stored energy electrical source stored energy electrical source what's a stored energy electrical source so here's what it says. Um, stored energy power supply systems, the types, 
Item three is a energy storage system. So you can have a UPS or 1778 device. You can have a fuel cell system. And remember, a fuel cell is not energy storage. So a fuel cell system is not energy storage. A complete functioning EPSS powered by a stored energy electrical source. So I would argue, and I'm going to argue this, that a fuel cell is a generator. It's not, there's no batteries in a fuel cell. I mean, just because you have the word cell, it sounds like it's an energy storage system. But my opinion, and correct me if I'm wrong, a fuel cell is like a generator. You have to give it some source, right? And nitrogen, I think, I can't remember, hydrogen, whatever, whatever that chemical or the gas is, you have to give it that for it to generate electricity. So it's not an energy storage system. So I would argue that has to come out. And then there's the energy storage system, and there should be an informational note to the energy storage system, item three, just like there is for item one, the UPS, referencing CUL9540, for further information. So, Michael Hufkin, I look forward to your public input. The 712E1 list item three, where it says energy storage systems. So, that tells me I can have an energy storage system. B, one of the options for our sources of power. But I also have to make sure that I have the supply duration covered by that energy storage system. So, energy storage systems is C note, and I, I think we should add an informational note. And then you have your storage battery, and we could probably add an informational note there too for storage batteries. And that, uh, to your point, uh, Robert, article, that's Article 480. Uh, batteries, batteries. What's a, a battery is 1989, right? I think that's 1989. That's the big hair band days, right? Um, anyway, so, and then other approved equivalent energy sources that comply with 712. And then you have fire protection suppression. So an energy storage system is recognized as an option for an emergency system, as long as you meet all the other rules, right? So now we go back to 705. No, we're going to go to 706. So 706 tells us, again, so, so that last sentence, very, very, I like the road that took us down, Robert. I like it. I understand that a little bit more. The, and we're just in the scope. Okay, so. We have standalone, we have interactive, and we know that uh, they can be used during normal operating conditions. And because it's referenced in Article 700, they can be used in abnormal operations. Or you could consider that an emergency system operating correctly is a normal working condition. Wow. So maybe that is a normal operating condition because it's an article, it may not be a normal operating condition for the power distribution system, but running on generator, running in, in your emergency system, it would be a normal operating condition for the emergency system. All right, so 706.3, <laughs> 706.3, Robert, you're right. The installation and maintenance of the energy storage equipment and all associated wiring, <laughs> The qualified person has to be doing the installation. What does that mean? Hold on. What is a qualified person? Robert, smart aleck. What's a qualified person? Is it defined in the NEC? Qualified person. And I would, oh, yes, it is. A qualified person is a defined term. Another defined term. See, NFPA guys and gals out there, uh, seven qualified person. I'm going to highlight that. And by qualified persons, those are 
Those are defined terms. Qualified person says, one who has skills and knowledge related to the construction and operation of the electrical equipment and installations and has received safety training to recognize and avoid the hazards involved. And they reference 70E 2021 standard for electrical safety in the workplace for electrical safety training requirements. Electrical safety training requirements. Stop. I need somebody. Stop. Not just anybody. I need a qualified person. So this says to see uh, training requirements is 110.6 and 70E. Now this is a qualified person has to be trained and knowledgeable in the construction and operation of equipment or a specific work method and be trained to identify and avoid the electrical hazards. Such persons shall also be familiar with the proper use of cautionary. A person shall be considered qualified with respect to certain equipment and tasks. Here's the problem I have, Michael. Here's my problem. When we use the, the word qualified person, Qualified person is defined, takes us back to Article 100, and it says construction and operation of the electrical equipment. It doesn't say the installation of the electrical equipment. Right. You can be, you can be qualified. Quali how we, wow, the way we use the word qualified person in the code does not mean that the person is trained on the installation of the product. In my opinion, right? It says, should only be performed by qualified persons. So all this is doing is saying that the person who is doing the installation, it doesn't say they have to know how to install an energy storage system. It just says they have to be skilled and knowledgeable about the construction and operation of the equipment and installations and have to have safety training. So the qualified person requirement here is not that the person has to be qualified to understand the installation. I could say I have never installed an energy storage system in my life. But I know how they work. I know what the safety hazards are. I know there's a shock hazard. I know there's an arc flash hazard. I have met 706.3, the qualified person requirement. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you think there's an opportunity somewhere in here to say that the person installing this should be knowledgeable on the installation of these systems? That's not necessarily the qualified person. Do you think we have to work on the definition of a qualified person? How it is applied in the NEC? Not 70E qualified person, but an NEC qualified person. So do we need a definition for qualified persons pertaining to the NEC installation. Thought-provoking item of the day. All right, so there are system requirements. So there's commissioning, and, the, and I was going down the words of road, road of commissioning because I was in uh, NFPA 855, and there's a Chapter 6 for commissioning, and in Article 706 for Energy Storage Systems, there is a section 706.7 for commissioning and maintenance. And to your point, Robert, NFPA 70B handles the maintenance side. The commissioning, it says, oh, look at this, commissioning, Chapter 6. It's referenced in the informational note to the first level subdivision A, commissioning. In 706.7, it tells us that upon installation, it has to be commissioned. And, and it ooh, doesn't apply to one 
and two family dwelling units. So I do not have to commission an energy storage system, regardless of the size, if it's installed in, an, in a residential dwelling unit or in a one and two family dwelling. Well, Michael, the definition says one who has skills and knowledge related to the construction and operation of electrical equipment and installations. It, it doesn't say equip. Wow. I, I think it's a stretch. Electrical equipment and installations. Not installing the electrical equipment. It's just the installation, which could be the system. I don't read it like, how do you install a product in the definition of a qualified person? So, but this is good. We can argue and debate about it. And you know what I like about this arguing, Michael? <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> I like arguing with you like this. This is the best way to have a debate. This is the best way. Because I can't hear you. You can't. You can't it's, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Anyway, so commissioning points you to 855. That is specifically Chapter 6. And then maintenance points you to NFPA 70B, which if you have to be living under a rock to not know that NFPA 70B is now a standard. It went from a recommended practice to a standard. Yeah, baby. All right. There's a maximum voltage shall be the input and output voltages indicated on the nameplates or the system listing. So system requirements, there are system requirements. So um, that has to have a nameplate. So 706.4, Michael, I would argue is covered by the listing. If you buy a listed product, you should automatically meet all the requirements in 706.4, but are you required to install only listed products? Yes, you are. 706.5 says energy storage systems shall be listed. Oh, makes life a lot simpler. 706.4 just tells you uh, what has to be marked on it and per the standard. Oh, you have a mute button. <laughs> what about specific system knowledge? There can be a gotcha there. The general, general, generally knowledgeable person may not be aware of. There are no heroes, just common sense professionals. Yes. Um, so, so that's the thing. That's the thing. I think that there's an opportunity, Michael. And, and NHZXBOI, and I wrote your name down on a piece of paper, which I lost it because you told me who you were. I can't remember. Sorry about that, uh, brother. Um, there is a, from a qualified person perspective, I agree with everything that's in there, but also from an NEC perspective, I think when we say qualified person in the NEC, the first and foremost on everybody's list, at least in my mind, has always been that it's about you are knowledgeable about installing that piece of equipment. If I give you a receptacle and tell you go install this receptacle, and you've never installed a receptacle in your life, but you know that there's a shock hazard because it's 120. You know that there is an arc. No, there's no arc flash hazard because it's low voltage and where you're at in the system. But you know your primary hazard is a shock hazard. You know how to do the boundaries. You generally know the, the product, but you've never actually landed wire. What do you know about torque? What do you know about the installation requirements? What do you know about the space inside of the box? How many conductors you can put in there? What do you know about that? is a little different than what we talk about when we talk about a qualified person with regard to safety for the worker. So I think there's an opportunity. I don't know what the, I don't know. I'm just saying, I think there's an opportunity. Hey, have fun in the flight. Fly safe there, brother. Kawasaki fan. Ah, I get it now. I'm gonna call you Kawasaki. 
I won't call you Cal, but I'll call you Kawasaki. All right. Um, okay, so um, the labeling requirements in 706.4, those are covered by the listing requirements, and that's required to be listed in 706.5. And now you know the standard is 9540. Multiple systems. Um, multiple energy storage systems are permitted to be installed on the same premises. So I can have a bunch of different energy storage systems. Because remember, they can be big and small. They don't have to be just one location. We talked about commission and maintenance and maximum voltage. That's all in part one general. Those are the general requirements around energy storage systems. Then in part two, so let's just talk about in general, because I'm not going to be able to go through every of the requirements in, in 706, but, but you have a picture of all of the different codes and standards. NFPA 1, in fact, NFPA 1, I'm going to, um, am I done with, yeah, I'm, I'm forget about that. I'm going to go to NFPA 1. You know, that's when you go to view all publications, guess what? NFPA 1 is the first one on the list. Duh. All right. NFPA 1 is, 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 uh, is, let's do a search energy storage system in NFPA 1. There is a chapter 52 for energy storage systems in NFPA 1. The fire code chapter 52 is titled energy storage systems. So it must be important. And NFPA 1 is the fire code. So you have to follow the rules in NFPA 1, especially since it's not convoluted. It's they have a, a, a an entire. Look at this. Look. Let me tell you something. Look at this. Energy storage systems. Chapter 52 of NFPA 1. Energy storage systems having an aggregate capacity exceeding the threshold quantities established in Table 1.3 of 855 shall comply with all of Chapter 52. So you can't ignore NFPA 1, especially since there's an entire chapter of the document that pertains to energy storage systems. I mean... Anyway, so let's take a look at the, um, so part one is general. Part two is your disconnecting means. So you're going to have to have a, a means to, to disconnect the energy storage system. And they give you guidance in here on the location and the control and the notification and marking requirements, uh, the warning labels, the um, uh, remote activation, things of that nature. Uh, they talk about connection to energy sources. Etc. So uh, there's a disconnecting means requirements. Part three are installation requirements. They talk about ventilation. They talk about uh, spaces, space, working space around the energy storage system. Uh, there's only one, two sections in part three. One is your general requirements. That is your, you know, that is your ventilation requirements. Talks about for a dwelling unit, um, you can't exceed. 100 volts DC between conductors uh, or ground for energy storage systems used in dwelling units. So no one, nothing greater than 100, 100 volts. Do not exceed 100 volts. Um, now, they have an exception. They say where the live parts are not accessible during routine energy storage system maintenance, a maximum voltage of 600 volts DC is permitted. Interesting. All right, so space is about, uh, they got space. So they got space. <laughs> so they got space, workspace, they talk about dwelling units, and, and they have a directory identify, identifying all your energy storage systems uh, in, at the location. Part four are your circuit requirements. This is where you're gonna have your circuit sizing, you should have overcurrent protection. 706.31 tells you how to protect the conductors, how to size the conductors. They have charge control. Provision shall be provided to control the charging process of the energy storage system. And I would hazard a guess. I hazard a guess. You have a listed product. It's probably going to have the parts of the charging control built in. I'm just, I'm going out on a limb, Michael. All right, so charge controllers, uh, uh, part five, which is the second to last part, flow battery energy storage systems. Part five applies to energy storage systems composed of or containing flow batteries. 
Um, so, and the system and systems components shall meet mark parts one, two, and three, electrolytic classification, electrolyte containment, flow controls, and pumps and other fluid handling equipment. So part five deals with flow battery energy storage systems. And part six is other energy storage technologies. This is your flywheel, right? So your flywheels are in there and then your general requirements and your fly, this specifically, they probably could have called this flywheel. Part six is flywheels. And that's all there is to 706. So 706 is a relatively short, but here's what I think. The complexity of energy storage systems lies in, in our last little four minute episode here. Um, all right, uh, Willie says NFP 72. Let's see if NFP 72 has anything related to energy storage systems. NFPA 72, view all publications. We're gonna search for 72. Wait, this what? Look at this. Look, I mean, you search for 72, you go like that, NFPA 72, you click it like that, and then boom. And then here's what you do. You go search, and you do all of NFPA 72, and look at this. 26.3.5.2.2, uh, verifying operation con condition of all supervised equipment, telephones, energy storage systems. So it's in there. And there's annex material, annex 2.2, there's your other publications. So I would say the requirement in 72 is found in that one section. Oh, boy. 26.3.5.2.2, which 26.3.5 is facilities. 26.3.5.2 is your subsidiary, subsidiary station buildings of those portions. And then uh, the subsidiary facility shall be inspected at least monthly by central station personnel for purpose of verifying the operation and condition of all supervised equipment, telephones, energy storage systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So I think the challenge with an energy storage system, one, is to identify. But it's not a challenge anymore because you know you're going to look for the listing mark, right? And we know the standard, standard is 9540. So anybody who says, UPSs are energy storage systems. You say, no, they're not. A UPS is a UPS is a UPS. Not listed to 9540. It's not an energy storage system. It can look like a duck, smell like a duck, and quack like a duck. But if it's not listed to be a duck, it's not a duck. All right? So, <laughs> Robert, yes, my singing lesson. So, um, so I think the challenge on energy storage systems, one, is making sure you understand when you have an energy storage system. And then two, is to understand that all of those other areas in the NFPA documents that apply to energy storage systems. NFPA 72. So the NFPA 72 is not even listed in the scope of 706. So here's, a, here's another thing that you can do. Let me show you this. If you go to search and you do all um, select publications, this will tell you everywhere the term energy storage systems are used. NFPA 1, NFPA 70, NFPA 55, we know those. 70B, NFPA 5000. Energy storage systems is 55.14. Look, you got 10 pages. Uh, 855, NFPA 70, NFPA 1700. Energy storage systems, that's annex material. 855, 70B, 855, NFPA 1700, Guide for Structural Firefighting. So there are a lot of other standards you need to think about when you deal with energy storage systems. Look at this, uh, NFPA 111. So I think that's another challenge with energy storage systems. Hey, it's a, you know, it's a technical product you have to install, but we deal with that. Our industry deals with that every day. Photovoltaics, batteries, uh, circuit breakers, fuses, uh, panel boards, switchboards, switch gear, 
a motor control centers, motor starters. I mean, there's a lot of technically detailed products that we install on a day-to-day -day basis. Energy storage system, in my opinion, we, we can handle that. The challenge, in my opinion, comes to understand. <laughs> understand. Understand the breadth. And you know what, Michael, if UL could list a duck, I'm sure they would, okay? Oh, my gosh. And I'd sell a duck, all right? So I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> oh, I love you, brother. I love you. So anyway, um, I think the challenge lies in when it comes to energy storage systems, A, you have to understand the energy storage system. You have to follow the instructions. You've got the working space. You have the disconnect requirements. You have the, the power limitation capabilities. Um, you have the, the sizing of conductors. You have the sizing of your overcurrent tech. We do that. That's what we do in the electrical industry. We live it. We breathe it. We eat it. We, we have it twice a day for breakfast, right? Three times on Sunday. The challenge is all of these other standards that we have to think about with regard to energy storage systems. 855 is one of them. Uh, we, we, 72, we heard. NFPA 1, we talked about. Um, I think that, that, that um, and then <laughs> Jody Wages, quack, quack, yeah. And then the, um, the other challenge with, um, with, with, with all of this, I I saw quack quack. And I, I lost my my train of thought. I, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, you got me. You got me, brother. Um, I do think that the challenge with energy storage systems is understanding the big picture. Right, our electrical industry can handle new technologies. We need the codes and standards and the requirements to help us install those. Help us not install them. They don't help us install. Them. It helps us make a safe installation, right? Why? We want to control liabilities. We want to control, we don't want to be end up in court, whether you're a contractor, you're a homeowner, you're a manufacturer, uh, you're a maintainer, you're a service provider, whatever. You don't want to end up in court because you did something wrong. We find and follow these rules on a daily basis. You need to understand them and you need to get outside of the box. Don't think energy storage stops at Article 706. That's where it begins. All right? So hopefully you got something out of today other than look forward to UL listing ducks in the future. Um, hopefully you got something out of today's uh, session. Thanks for all that you do for the electrical industry. Thanks for what you do for electrical safety. Remember to stay safe and please, by all means, stay healthy. And I'll see you next week. You too, Michael. And Lou and Jody and everybody else that, that came in and Mr. Kawasaki out there. All right. Take care. Stay safe. See you, see you next week.